indeed he has given us freedom because of that resurrection power living inside of us. And you've been noticing this morning a lot of the songs are just about that, the resurrection power, because that is the theme that we encounter in the text this morning. So if you want to turn your Bibles again to the Gospel of Mark, we're in chapter 12. We're going to be looking at verses 18 through 27. And you can see that I've titled the sermon, Eternity and Resurrection, Absurdity or Reality. So follow along with me as I read from verse 18 through 27 and we'll jump into the message. And Sadducees came to him who say that there is no resurrection. And when they asked him a question saying, teacher, Moses wrote for us that if a man's brother dies and leaves a wife but leaves no child, the man must take the widow and raise up offspring for his brother. There were seven brothers. The first took a wife. And when he died, he left no offspring. And the second took her and died, leaving no offspring. And the third likewise. And the seven left no offspring. Last of all, the woman also died. In the resurrection... When they rise again, whose wife will she be? For the seven had her as a wife. Jesus said to them, Is this not the reason you are wrong? Because you know neither the scriptures nor the power of God. For when they rise from the dead, they neither marry nor are given in marriage, but are like angels in heaven. And as for the dead being raised, have you not read in the book of Moses, in the passage about the bush, How God spoke to him, saying, I am the God of Abraham and the God of Isaac and the God of Jacob. He is not God of the dead, but of the living. You are quite wrong. The dominant view of the afterlife in the ancient world was that it didn't exist. There was no afterlife. It was common. And on many tombstone and and grave markers and inscriptions, you'd find certain things written that that would kind of be like our modern day RIP, rest in peace. They'd say things like, "I, I was not, I was, I am not, I do not care, kind of short epitaph, pithy statements about the meaninglessness of life and no afterlife. A couple in specific were very gloomy just by way of example. Dark, pointless, the futility of life. And and they said things like this. I did not exist. I was born. I existed. I do not exist. So much for that. If anyone says anything different, he will be lying. I shall not exist. Or another one. When I had just tasted life, Fate snatched me, an infant, and I did not see my father's pattern. But I died after enjoying the light of 11 months. Then I returned it. I lie in the tomb forever, no longer seeing the light. But you, stranger, read this and weep as you come upon the tomb of you knowing. Tragic for you knowing and the like. And it's common even today where a lot of people don't believe in an afterlife. Or they have strange views of what this afterlife and this existence looks like. At best, some people believe in, they like to hope for, oh, yeah, no, after we die, everyone goes to heaven. You know, we're all part of the blessed existence in heaven. We get to enjoy that if you're a good person. But, but certainly no hell in the afterlife. Or others believe in other strange things like a a reincarnation. You come back to earth and it's just a vicious cycle on this karmic wheel. You just keep going around and round and round. Others just believe that nothing happens. And they're completely content without questioning that. After you die, you just cease to exist. Like in the ancients. That is it. You accept it. 
you have however many years God's given you. Not God, you don't even believe in God. However many years you have, you die, and that's it. Nothing comes after death. But for the vast majority of people today, they simply do not like to think about death. Right? Because we're so busy living our lives, we're so caught up in the here and now, in the hustle and bustle, and especially in this side of the world, in a capitalist economy, opportunities all over the pace, fast-paced consumeristic lifestyle, nobody likes to think about death and the afterlife. And if they do think about it, they certainly don't think about it in terms of a resurrection into eternity. Right? That idea is strange. That's that's weird. And that's exactly what we see with the Sadducees here this morning struggle with. That they can't accept the idea of a resurrection and afterlife because they're trying to understand it in terms of their earthly experience and analogy in this life and the here and now, and it makes absolutely no sense. They can't consider what it would be like because all they know is their human earthly experience. And because of it, they come to Jesus here with this question. And of course, from their perspective, coming from the Sanhedrin, they're trying to trap him. They're trying to find another way to discredit him, to disqualify him, his teaching and his authority. And particularly on this issue, because they see it as foolishness. It is absurd to believe in a resurrection and certainly one unto life. And so they come to him with this scenario of a woman who marries seven brothers consecutively. Jesus, how in the world could there be a resurrection and an afterlife? If that's the case, whose wife will she be in the resurrection? And they think they've got him. And Jesus says, you misunderstand. You know neither the scriptures nor the power of God. And that's the key to understanding this text. And that's the key to understanding the resurrection and eternity. It is the power of God revealed in scripture. It's faith. It's something you can't ascend to by reason. All the evidence is for it. It is completely and purely an act of faith in believing what God has said in the scripture about resurrection and specifically starting with the resurrection of his son because he was first raised from the dead. God promises to raise anyone who believes in him from the dead in the final eschatological ending of all things. And you accept that by faith and only by faith. Faith specifically in Jesus as the object of your faith and worship and trust. And those who worship him, who believe in him, and who love him have the hope of resurrection, eternity, unto life in heaven in God's kingdom forever. And those that don't, do not. And that's what we're going to look at this morning. And by way of reminder, just to bring those of you up to speed who perhaps weren't here last week or didn't get a chance to tune in online or just to refresh your memory, last week, it was a special group sent by the Sanhedrin, right? The religious leadership, the establishment of Israel, the chief priests, the scribes, and the elders. Jesus is in Jerusalem, and there's a series of controversies now in the temple because what they've seen him do in destroying the commerce, and they're trying to seize him, arrest him, and kill him. The plot is in motion. And the Herodians and the Pharisees were sent last week. Strange bedfellows. The Pharisees, one of the relig most religious sect and parties in Israel of the day. They were devout, they were pure, they were faithful. And they were sent, both of those groups, strategically because they could each accuse Jesus of the opposite depending on what he chose. And they said, hey, should we pay taxes to Caesar or not? And the Pharisees, if Jesus were to say, Yes, we should. They're going to accuse him of being falsely religious. He's not really about the kingdom of God because, look, he's given in to the pagan, worldly Roman Empire. And so he'd lose influence over the people. And on the other hand, the Herodians? The Herodians were followers of Herod and the Her Herodian dynasty in his rule. And they had a lot to gain because they were puppets of the Romans. And they were profiting much from the tax schemes, etc., and so if Jesus said, no, don't pay taxes, then they could accuse him of sedition, which was punishable by death. So they have Jesus trapped. 
They throw him on the horns of this dilemma, and each one of these horns is going to impale him, right? Or so they think. It's not so. That's how Jesus responded in a stunningly simple, yet incredibly enigmatic way. He says, pulls out a coin. Whose image is on the coin? Okay, Caesar's. And whose image is on you? God's. So give to Caesar what's Caesar, and to God's, and to God what's God's. And they leave. They have nothing left to say. Like the chief priests and scribes and elders before him who just questioned his authority, they leave with their heads down and their tails between their legs. Jesus has outwitted them once again. Which brings us to the text this morning in verse 18. And this morning, for the first and only time in Mark's gospel, we're introduced to an obscure group, an obscure sect, a party within the leadership of Israel known as the, the Sadducees. And look what verse 18 says. And the Sadducees came to him who say that there is no resurrection. Who is this strange group? Well, they are obscure. There's not much in history telling us about them. What we know more than anything is from their enemies, from those who are kind of their, their political or religious opponents, like the Pharisees, etc. We see that recorded in Josephus, the historian. We see a little bit about that here. It says, one thing in particular, there is no resurrection. So that's what they believe theologically. There is no resurrection. We think the Sadducees probably arose around the same time as the Pharisees. This was during the, the Maccabean revolt against the Seleucid dynasty in, in the early 2nd century B.C. Both of these religious sects kind of arose with opposing theological and political views. And they were different. See, the Pharisees believed in a resurrection after death. The Sadducees did not. The Pharisees believed in the sovereignty of God. The Sadducees emphasized human free will. The Pharisees believed in, in the written law, the, the law, the prophets, and the writings, all of the Old Testament canon as authoritative scripture, divinely inspired from God, and they accepted the oral tradition that was passed down through their fathers and their forefathers, which would later be codified as the Mishnah and the Talmud, right? The Sadducees did not. They only accepted the Torah, the five books of the law, the Pentateuch, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. That is it. The rest of it was not from God in their eyes. And of course, the key point of difference that's related to the controversy this morning is on the resurrection. They didn't believe a resurrection. They didn't. We see that here. We see that in the book of Acts. If you follow Luke, I think it's in Acts 26, when Paul is before the Sanhedrin again, and cleverly, he knows the Sanhedrin, the, the religious leadership of Israel, is comprised of those of the, the Pharisaic view and those of the Sadducean view. And he tries to pit them against each other. He says, hey, he appeals to his brothers because he comes, he's a Pharisee. He says, I'm like you, guys. I believe... I'm here because I'm trying to preach in the resurrection hope in the future. And then it caused a big debate, dissension, within the ranks between the Pharisees and the Sadducees. So this was a big deal for them. And you see that clearly also as Luke records the, the outset of the church when Peter and John are brought before them as well in Acts 4 and Acts 5. The Sadducees are an important party within the religious establishment and have even greater prominence than the Pharisees, oddly enough. But we don't hear much about them. In the Gospels. And they dominated particularly the priesthood and the high priesthood. So they had, they had intense, immense religious influence over the people and immense political influence being on the Sanhedrin, the ruling council of Israel. So these weren't chums. Even if they were not believing in a resurrection. And they come to Jesus now with this because politically, they were pro-Roman. See, that was the difference between them and the Pharisees. They had, more, they had more in common with the Herodians in this case. They were pro-Roman because they had a lot to benefit from their position and power. They didn't want no Messiah to come in to 
knock off the hand that feeds them. No, they were perfectly content with Roman rule. They were the aristocratic, high priests, wealthy, powerful. And that's why they come to him with this question now. They also have something to gain from Jesus being put out of the picture. And so they come to him with a question. Look at the rest of verse 18. They come to him with a scenario. A scenario so absurd that they are hoping the obvious answer in this loaded scenario is to reduce Jesus' resurrection view of the afterlife to absurdity. And look at the rest of verse 18. And they asked him a question saying, Teacher, Moses wrote for us that if a man's brother dies and leaves a wife but leaves no child, the man must take the widow and raise up offspring for his brother. There were seven brothers. The first took a wife, and when he died, he left no offspring. And the second took her and died, leaving no offspring. And the third likewise, and the seven left no offspring. Last of all, the woman also died. In the resurrection, when they rise again, whose wife will she be? For the seven had her as a wife. That's a strange scenario, isn't it? And the best guess we have is they possibly borrowed the story, even if in a different context, from the apocryphal book, Tobit, which is in the Catholic Bible. And there's a story in Tobit that talks about a woman named Sarah who successively married seven brothers. And, and none of the marriages were consummated because there was a, a demon, Osmodeus, that, that kept hindering the marriages from being consummated. And finally, she married the seventh, Tobias, who was the son of Tobit, with the help of the angel Raphael, who managed to somehow defeat Osmodeus. And she married him. That's the best guess we have. It's not the same context or purpose. No, there, it's just talking about Leverite marriage. Here, this is specifically about the resurrection. And what is Leverite marriage? Well, it's exactly... What the Sadducees reference in verse 19, when they say, Teacher, Moses wrote for us. That's Leverite marriage. And where did Moses write this? All the way back in Deuteronomy 5, 25 and 26. What is this Leverite marriage? It was a provision in the Mosaic law that said this. If a man is married to a woman and he dies, his brother has a responsibility to take his wife as his in order to bear offspring for him, and to thus guarantee his inheritance. That's the Leverite provision. And, and really, the point of it was twofold. On the one hand, yes, to protect the widow and to provide for her and care for her. And on the other hand, to protect and ensure that the husband's bloodline continues and so his inheritance in the family line. To guarantee that. That was the purpose of it. And so they think they come to him here with a perfect scenario. This scenario of, of Leverite marriage. Which if you consider in light of the resurrection and afterlife, really is futile, isn't it? It's a good question they're posing here. They think they have Jesus stuck. And it's because at the very least, in their quoting Moses, remember they only hold the Torah to be authoritative, it's the five books, this is from Deuteronomy. And the Torah teaches monogamous marriage relationship, right? One man, one woman. So polygamy isn't an option. What's going to happen here? One woman, seven husbands in the resurrection. And, and you can imagine being there listening to this conversation. Because they know from the beginning that this is, this is a joke. And the answer is obvious. You could picture them talking to Jesus and asking him smugly, well, what do you say, Jesus? Consider this, Jesus, I know you believe in a resurrection, but what about this? What if there was a woman who married a man and he died without having children with her? And so his brother took up his, the woman, his wife, and then he also died without children. And then the third brother did the same, all the way down to the seventh, all without children until finally she dies. What's going to happen in the resurrection? Whose wife will she be? 
Jesus. You might say if one of them had children, then that would be the clear winner because there's children, but, but none of them have children. So what say you, Jesus? Huh? Do you see how ridiculous the resurrection is that you profess and teach, Jesus? It's absurd. It doesn't work. This is polygamy. And how does Jesus respond? Look at what he says in verse 24. Jesus said to them, Is this not the reason you are wrong? Because you know neither the scriptures nor the power of God? Wow, what an indictment. What a statement. In saying this, he is cutting them to the core. Because in their minds, as the Sadducees on the Sanhedrin, the ruling council of Israel, they knew power. Oh yeah, they knew political power. And as masters of the Torah, the five books that they alone held authoritative, you know they knew the scriptures in their own minds. Jesus is not saying you're wrong here on the peripherals, on the incidentals, on the outside of your belief system. He's saying at the very center and core of what you believe and who you are, you are dead wrong. You have it all wrong. You know, neither the scriptures nor the power of God. You don't know the scriptures, which talks about the power of God to raise you up from the dead. And so you don't believe in a resurrection. You don't know the power of God, who is far greater, far superior, far more transcendent, who spoke the world into creation, you don't know the power of God because you don't know that he could create an afterlife and a resurrection existence that resolves your little so-called hypothetical. You don't know it. You know, neither the scriptures and neither the power of God. This is a big indictment. In other words, you guys are lost. You are completely lost. And that word there, for you don't know or error or whatever it is in your version, it, it comes from the Greek word planeto, from which we get planet. And it literally means to wander off track, to err. He's saying, you have completely wandered off from the truth of God as revealed in Scripture. You don't know him and you don't know his power. You need to go all the way back to the beginning. And you need a Theology 101 class. Because everything you thought you knew to be true is wrong if you don't believe in the resurrection. And you're in an even more dangerous spot than you know. And so he says, let me, let me help you. Let me start by correcting this egregious error based on the assumption of what you think resurrected eternity is going to look like. And the nature of it. And he goes to verse 25. For when they rise from the dead, they neither marry nor are given in marriage, but are like angels in heaven. And the first thing you need to understand, Sadducees, is that in the resurrection, the institution of marriage is gone. You're not, you're not given in marriage and you never marry. It's over. So whatever idea you've had about resurrection, flush it. That is not true. And interestingly, look what he says. There's no marriage. You're not given in marriage. You don't marry. But instead, you're like angels in heaven. Wow. You, you can't understand the resurrected life in terms of earthly categories. Those are too mundane. Those are too low. You cannot imagine it. So let me give you a little bit of a picture. You'll be like angels in heaven, he says. I need to give you a heavenly analogy so you understand as best as your human finite mind can imagine. But notice what he says. He says you'll be like angels. You'll become like angels. He doesn't say you'll become angels. All right, I know a lot of pop culture, movies, media kind of depicts this a lot or we like to believe that. You hear people talking about that. Oh, you know, so-and-so passed away, and I know they're my angel in heaven. 
my guardian angel watching over me. That's, that's not true. And that's not what Jesus is saying here. No, human beings do not become angels. Okay, there's a fundamental difference and distinction in our nature and in our purpose between human beings and angels. And we see that delineated clearly by the writer of Hebrews in the first chapter and in the second chapter. We are different. We are different. Jesus uses the analogy so that they can understand that they cannot think of the afterlife in human categories in terms of human institutions, even like marriage. No, think about angels. Think about the spiritual, the supernatural. All right, you can't imagine it. And if anything, the allusion to angels, the analogy to angels, probably points to the fact that we're going to be worshiping God and serving God at a whole other level, just like the angels do, incessantly. We'll be like angels. And now I know at this point, a lot of Christians, maybe a lot of you, have sadness, maybe tears in your eyes. Oh no, what does that mean? There's no more marriage in, in eternity in heaven. What's going to happen to all the years I've spent nourishing my intimate relationship with my husband or my wife and my children and grandchildren, all my loved ones and friends? Oh no, Jesus is saying that's not going to be there. That's not what Jesus is saying. That would be to read way too much into his words that aren't there. He's not saying that at all. He's not saying the intimacy of our earthly relationships will not be there in the resurrected eternity. He's saying the institution of marriage will not be there. Why won't that be there? Because the purpose of marriage is procreation. And in eternity, there's no more death, so there's no more need to procreate and to be fruitful and to multiply and to fulfill that creation mandate all the way back in Genesis 1, 26 to 27, to be fruitful and to multiply. No more need for that, because death is conquered. That's why marriage isn't needed. If anything, I think we can safely say that our relationships here with our loved ones and our wives and husbands and children and grandchildren and everyone we hold dear and near will be there in heaven. And if anything, they'll be on a whole other level in terms of intimacy and love. They'll be even deeper than our human finite minds can imagine. It's pretty safe to assume that. be like angels and what else does Jesus say but are like angels in heaven it still doesn't give us much okay so that's all we have but what is heaven going to be like what is this resurrected existence going to be like huh and because we're not told much people have been forced into sheer speculation and they've come up with things like we see so often depicted in pop culture, right? Floating on clouds like angels and, and playing the harp in a boring, humdrum, mundane, whoa, 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 yawning existence. Doesn't sound too exciting, right? But that also couldn't be further from the truth. That's not true. That's not what the Bible tells us. And you say, so what does the Bible tell us about resurrection reality and eternity what are we going to be doing in heaven what is the kingdom going to look like well i'm glad you asked and because you did i'm going to take you on a small roller coaster ride through some important scriptures that you need to know so that you can be excited about what the lord's prepared for you in his kingdom you're not going to be on a cloud playing a harp that would be pointless no the God who has all creative power, of which we've been given a taste in this earth and the universe around us, which we can study, the planets, the solar system. It says, no eye can see, no ear can imagine, or heart or mind think what God has prepared for those who love him. Imagine that creative power, which we've already witnessed here, which is enough to bring you to your knees in worship and adoration. Imagine what he's prepared. And what has he prepared? If you go to Genesis 1, all the way back to the beginning, I want you 
want you to see something. Something that perhaps many of you haven't seen now. That is going to blow your minds. If there is one overarching theme in Scripture, from Genesis to Revelation, it is the kingdom of God. It is the kingdom of God centered on the king of God's kingdom, Jesus Messiah. That's what the Bible's about, in a nutshell. And all the way back in Genesis 1, 26 to 27, here's what God says. So God rules the universe. Everything in it is his. He owns it. He created it. He sustains it. And when he created the world, the earth, he mediated that reign through mankind. What do you mean by that? Look at Genesis 1, 26. Then God said, let us make man in our image, after our likeness, and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the birds of the heavens, and over the livestock, and over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creeps on earth. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him, male and female, he created them. And God blessed them, and God said to them, be fruitful, and multiply, and fill the earth, and subdue it, and have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the birds of the heavens, and over every living thing that moves on the earth. Yes, God rules, and when he created the earth, he mediated that rule through man. And in that word there for dominion, rule, it really means that, to rule, to have dominion over, to dominate. That's the mandate. He created us to do this. But unfortunately, we saw very early on in the creation story, just two chapters later, what happened, didn't we? In the fall, man failed almost immediately at this one task, this one mandate that God gave them. And so God set a plan in motion for the redemption of man But he also described and delineated the continued purpose, the role of man within God's kingdom program. And it's all over scripture, but for the sake of time, I'm going to show you some key important passages only. Turn to Psalm 8. In Psalm 8, 4 to 8, here's what the psalmist says. What is man that you are mindful of him, and the son of man that you care for him? Yet you have made him a little lower than the heavenly beings, and crowned him with glory and honor. And here's the key, verse 6. You have given him dominion over the works of your hands, and you have put all things under his feet, all sheep and oxen, and also the beasts of the field, the birds of the heavens, and the fish of the sea, whatever passes along the paths of the seas. Did you see that? That's directly alluding to Genesis 1, 26 to 28. That's man. You have given him dominion over the works of your hands. You put all things under his feet. You say, wait a second, all things aren't under our feet. Is this talking future? Where does this find fulfillment? Well, I'm glad you asked that too. Because we know we failed all the way back in Genesis 3. And if you turn to Ephesians 1, Ephesians 1, and you see what the Apostle Paul has to say about this. Listen what he says in Ephesians 1, 22. And he's speaking of Jesus. And listen to the language here. That's Psalm 8, verse 6. And he put all things under his feet and gave him as head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills all in all. And again, in 1 Corinthians 15, 25 to 27, almost the exact same language and the same quotation of Psalm 8, 6. Listen to 1 Corinthians 15, 25 to 27. For he must reign until he has put all his enemies under his feet. The last enemy to be destroyed is death. For God has put all things in subjection under his feet. But when it says all things are put in subjection, it is plain that he is accepted who put all things in subjection under him. Who is this talking about? It's not us. It's Christ. Christ is reigning. God has put all things in subjection under his feet. 
And in the eschatology of all things, we'll finally do so. And then the son here, like it says, will be finally subjected himself to the father. But all things are under his feet. This is Christ who first and foremost fulfills the mandate because man failed from the very beginning to subdue and have dominion over the earth. Christ did it. He did it in our place. And he will reign and rule forever when he comes again in the second coming in the thousand-year mediatorial kingdom on earth, right? Revelation 19, 15, he will reign and rule with a rod of iron. But, but now we get to the part that I wanted to tell you about, about what we're going to be doing in the kingdom, what the Bible says we're going to be doing in the kingdom. And if you turn to Revelation 2, the last book in the Bible Listen to what Jesus is saying in this revelation to the Apostle John in verses 26 to 27. The one who conquers and who keeps my works until the end, to him I will give authority over the nations, and he will rule them with a rod of iron. Who is this he? The believer. It's believers. It's us. Jesus is here saying, I will share my reign and my rule in the kingdom. In the same thing, chapter 3, verse 10, if you just turn the page. Look what he says in verse 10. He says, because you have kept my word about patient endurance, I will keep you from the hour of trial. Sorry, 321. In verse 321, he says, the one who conquers... I will grant him to sit with me on my throne as I also conquered and sat down with my father on his throne. What does it mean to sit on the throne? It means to reign. It means to rule. Chapter 5, verse 10. Look what he says. And you have made them a kingdom and priests to our God, and they shall reign on the earth. We shall reign on the earth. Do you understand that? We're not going to be floating around aimlessly in a purposeless existence, doing nothing. No, God is a God of purpose and a God of order, and he is a gracious God, and he gives gifts to those whom he loves, and he gave his son, of course, for everyone that whosoever would believe upon him would be saved. And in that saving eternal existence, you're going to be reigning and ruling and serving him all to his glory. And so the question is, who are we going to be reigning over in order to reign? You have to reign over people. You have to rule over people. And again, in the book of Revelation, in the last chapter, turn to chapter 22. Look at what it says in verses 3 and 5. Actually, verses 3 and 5 just talk about us reigning again in the end. And this is actually after the thousand-year kingdom. This is the eternal state now. The new Jerusalem, the new heavens, the new earth. Look what it says in verses 3 to 5. No longer will there be any, anything accursed, but the throne of God and of the Lamb will be in it, and his servants will worship him, that's us. They will see his face, and his name will be on their foreheads, and the night will be no more. They will need no light or lamp or sun, for the Lord God will be their light, and they will reign forever. And ever. We're going to reign forever and ever. We're going to have a serious task and mandate in the kingdom. We are going to be productive in the kingdom. But who are we reigning over to get back to that question? Flip back to chapter 21. And in chapter 21, verses 24 and 26, speaking of the new Jerusalem, John's been given this revelation. He's describing the glories of it, the beauty of it, the construction of it coming down from heaven, and in verses 24 to 26, look what he says. He says, by its light will the nations walk, and the kings of the earth will bring their glory into it, and its gates will never be shut by day, and there will be no night there. They will bring into the glory and the honor of the nations. We're ruling over the nations. Yeah, that's right. In the kingdom... You're not going to lose your nationality. You're not going to lose your ethnicity. 
I don't think you're going to lose anything about you that makes you you other than your fallen, corruptible human body, which will then be glorified. You'll be given a new body, a resurrection body, fit for the kingdom to live in eternity and to reign and rule over the nations, all for the glory of God and service to God. No, we're going to be productive. That's what we're going to do in the kingdom. That's heaven. It's not purposelessness. It's not futility. It's not absurdity. It's far beyond any of us could ever understand. No eye can see, no ear has heard, or mind imagined what God has prepared for those who love him, right? 1 Corinthians 2.9. And you've seen what the Apostle Paul said when he's recounting his experience when he's taken up to the third heaven. You remember that in 2 Corinthians 12, 2-4? to four, He says, I don't even know what happened. I'm going to try to explain it to you in human language, but I don't know. I, and he speaks of himself in the third person because he's trying to not boast. He says, I knew a man who was caught up to the third heaven. I don't know. Was it in the body? Was it out of the body? Outer body experience, as we call it, inner body? He says, I don't even know. But I know I was there, and I know what I saw. And I know what I heard. And he says, and it was things that human beings are not allowed to speak about. Incredible, he says. Incredible. And the Sadducees don't get that. We know that now. We know what to expect. It makes us anxious and eager for the kingdom. As the book of Revelation ends, the final book in the canon of inspired scripture ends saying, come, Lord Jesus, come, right, Maranatha? That's what that means. We're ushering in the kingdom because we want to reign and rule with him for his glory. But Jesus isn't done with the Sadducees now yet. No, he's not done. He's helped them. He's corrected their, their assumption of what the nature and the purpose of resurrected life will look like. They're dead wrong. It can't be explained in human analogies. You, you can't understand it. You can't reduce it to that. Trying to understand it in human analogies, you're better off. You couldn't imagine it any more than a baby in uterus who's trying to picture what a Beethoven concerto sounds like and what a sunset at the Grand Canyon looks like. They, they haven't got a clue. And that's about as much chance as you have as understanding it, says Jesus. But then he moves, then he moves in an incredibly brilliant, sheer brilliant way to ground his argument in the very scriptures that they claim to adhere to and claim is authoritative over their life and to be masters in, the Torah. He takes them not to the two texts, if anything, in the Old Testament that actually explicitly talk about a, a resurrection, a bodily resurrection and the final judgment to life and to death. No, he doesn't take them to Daniel 12, 1 to 2 or to Isaiah 26, 19. He takes them to Exodus 3. He, he takes them to Moses in the burning bush in verse 6. And look what he says. He says, and as for the dead being raised, have you not read in the book of Moses, in the passage about the bush, how God spoke to him saying, I am the God of Abraham and the God of Isaac and the God of Jacob. He is not God of the dead, but of the living. You are quite wrong. What is he saying? He's saying this. You are so wrong about the resurrection and your exegesis and interpretation of scripture that if you go all the way back to Exodus 3, 6 and what God says to himself when he speaks to Moses from the bush, I am the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. What he's essentially saying is Abraham and Isaac and Jacob died long before I'm speaking these words to you, Moses. And if I am their God now, that means they're still living. That's his argument. His argument is that God, who is a covenantal God and makes a covenant with his people, who always keeps his promises and is ever faithful, and who promises to raise them from the dead in a blessed eternal existence in his presence for all those who believe in him, he will do just that. And those who do believe in him are living. They're not dead. Because God is not the God of the dead, but of the living. The living God is the God of the living. He's talking about God's covenant faithfulness. God made a promise. 
And death won't break that promise, he's saying, because I have a bigger plan, a bigger program. It involves eternally, eternity, and it involves resurrection bodies. That's what he's saying. He's saying God wouldn't have said that to Moses if Abraham and Isaac and Jacob were dead for eternity. No. He says, I am the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Not I was because they're dead. Incredible. And then he ends saying almost exactly what he began his response with. In the beginning, he says, you are wrong. And now he says, you are very wrong. Now you are dead wrong. And they were dead wrong. They were dead wrong. Because they participated, along with the Pharisees and the rest of the leadership in Israel and the Sanhedrin, in a couple chapters from now, to arrest Jesus, to mock Jesus, to beat Jesus, and to hand him over to the Romans to be crucified. So it's pretty safe to say that I don't think they came to believe in the resurrection, the future resurrection, and, and more centrally and fundamentally, Jesus' resurrection through which any right understanding of future resurrection and the eschatology of all things must be grounded in. I don't think they believe that. But the question is, what about you and, and me and those tuning in online? Look, in A.D. 70, 35, 40 years or so after Jesus spoke these words, the temple was destroyed. And along with it, the Sadducees, because the temple was the center of their power, right? The aristocracy, the temple priesthood, all gone. Sadducees destroyed. There is nothing in history after A.D. 70 about the Sadducees. But the resurrection is the only way. So what about you and me? It didn't end well for them, for many of the Judaizers in Jesus' day. And for those up until this day who deny him and his death and his resurrection. Look, I was just at the dentist a couple weeks ago. And um, I had made an appointment. I had to get two small fillings. First in my life, actually, if you believe that. And, and actually, one of the two was a, a correction, a repair of one from a couple years ago. And, um, and I was there. And, of course, I hate to be there. You know, Proverbs 6.16 Six things the Lord hates. Yes, seven that are abominable to him. I think the dentist is number seven and eight there. The dentist is not fun with that drill up against your tooth. And so, anyways, I was there. Nice practice, uptown Whittier. And I'd met him previously, the dentist, when I had my x-rays and a consult. And I noticed the nice little cap on his head, and so I knew he was Jewish, probably an Orthodox Jew, you know. And we started talking, and he knew then that I was a pastor of a church here in Montebello. And I came back for my appointments. This is a couple weeks ago now. Sitting in the chair. And we start talking about certain things. And he says, why are, why are Protestants, and I know he meant evangelicals, why are they so pro-Israel? And I said, well, we're so pro-Israel because we believe in the Bible. Old Testament and New. And we know that Israel has a very special place in God's salvation history and the end of all things because they are his chosen people. Israel, his elect. I said, okay. And we started talking about a number of other things and one of the things we started talking about, um, somehow it came up about uh, Trump and politics and, and he says, and I could see the, the emotion in his face, he says, this is, this is unbelievable. We really, we really can't believe it. Um, Trump has done more for the nation of Israel than any other president in our history since we became officially recognized as a country in 1948. He says he moved, he promised he was going to move the embassy to Jerusalem, and he moved the embassy to Jerusalem. And, and he tears in his eyes, and he says, 
The whole world was against it. And those of you who were following, they were. All of the nations, the United Nations were against him. He said all the UN was against him, and he did it anyways, and we will never forget that. That's true. And then we started talking about, you know, where he worships at the synagogue. Actually, the one in Studio City, the same one that Ben Shapiro, if you know, he's a political commentator, worshipped or at least worse at past tense. Now he moves his headquarters out of California uh, to Nashville, Tennessee, for obvious reasons. Um, and he started asking me about uh, the Messiah. He says, Protestants are, are very messianic, too. And I, I knew what he meant. I'm not so sure he even knew what he meant, but I said, yes, that's right, of course we are. We, we, we very much believe in the promised Messiah. We see the Messiah... Uh, mentioned throughout all the Old Testament uh, in the Psalms, predicting this Messiah, this anointed one of God, right? Psalm 1, Psalm 2, Psalm 8, have we seen, as we've seen, Psalm 110 and 2, and especially in the prophets, I said, in Isaiah the prophet, in Isaiah 53, the great messianic prophecy about the anointed one of God who will die a substitutionary death in the place of sinners and bear their sin and make many righteous. And, and we believe that that Messiah is the historical Jesus. And that's when he got quiet. And I could see that he, he wasn't interested to talk about Jesus anymore. And actually, that's when he took the drill and started going really hard on my tooth. And I knew, <laughs> he said, I shouldn't have said that. But you see the point. It's sad, isn't it? It's tragic. For the Sadducees, for him, for Orthodox Jews today, for anyone who continues to reject Jesus as the promised Messiah, Savior, Lord, and Son of God. Because there is no other name in, under heaven and earth by which anyone can be saved, Acts 4.12. Right? Right? Jesus says, I am the resurrection and the life, and anyone who believes in me, even though he dies, will live in eternity. I am the way, the truth, and the life. Nobody comes to the Father but by me. There is no other way. That's how fundamental the, the resurrection is. And actually, Paul talking about it in 1 Corinthians 15 he talks about the resurrection and the centrality of it. He says, if there's two things you need to know, that the entire universe revolves around and your eternal destination hangs in the balance, it's the death of Christ and the resurrection of Christ. And he starts talking about the resurrection because some in that church apparently didn't believe it. And he says, what are you doing? He says, don't you understand? If there is no resurrection, then your faith and everything you've been doing to live your life according to God and what God commands is in vain. It's futility. He says, just eat, drink, and be merry then, because we're all going to die, and that's going to be it. Just live for today and now, if there's no resurrection. That's how central the resurrection is to the meaning and the purpose of life and the way to heaven and eternity. It's all about the resurrection. And then Paul says this in that long chapter in 1 Corinthians 15. In verse 50, he says, I tell you this, brothers, flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, nor does the perishable inherit the imperishable. Behold, I tell you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall be changed. And in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet, for the trumpet will sound, and the dead will be raised imperishable, and we shall be changed. For this perishable body must put out the imperishable, and this mortal body must put on the immortality. When the perishable puts on the imperishable, and the mortal puts on immortality, then shall come to pass the saying that is written, and here it is. Death is swallowed up in victory. O oh, death, where is your sting? O oh, death, where is your victory? The sting of death is sin, and the power of sin is the law. And here it is. But thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. That's the victory. The victory over the sting of death and sin on the cross. 
validated by the resurrection. And anyone who believes in Jesus, anyone who follows Jesus, has the hope of an eternal existence, a resurrected eternal existence, pain-free, suffering-free, heartache-free, anxiety-free, in an eternal existence, serving God, worshiping God, and working for God, all to the glory of God, forever. And all you have to do is believe. Bow with me.